question for the 70s. Can man survive? Here's one answer from Atomic Energy Commission Research Associate Dr. Arthur Tamplin. Man quite possibly could survive. If he does survive, he's going to have to change the nature of some of his institutions. He can survive on the basis of a monologue, nor can he survive on the basis of the intersection of a number of monologues. He's only going to be able to survive if what he is doing with his science and with his technology and with his government and industries which more or less promote and stimulate this science and technology, he's only going to be able to survive if he's going to be able to effectively criticize what is going on in his scientific and technological development. Dr. Tamplin has been a severe critic of some of the things going on in our present day scientific and technological development. And some of the controversies he and other scientists have engendered will be the subject of this report on energy and man. Produced by Walter McGraw for Group W Westinghouse Broadcasting Company with Dr. Harry Shapiro of the American Museum of Natural History as consultant. I'm Gary Moore. We're told that it was about 400 years ago that the real speed-up started. It was then that almost everything, gradually at first and then at a more rapid pace, began to happen faster. Population began to grow, information started to come faster, and life began to become more hectic. But according to the late AEC commissioner, T.J. Thompson, this might not continue. It's rather a stern set of alternatives. You have either to get a solution to the energy problem or else there won't be any more civilization. It's as simple as that. In the short space of 900 years, we will have utilized most of the energy sources available to mankind throughout the ages, from the past and into the future. Therefore, if we don't find an answer, the civilization as we've seen it in the past and in the future will be just sort of a blip on the eons of time. It'll not be more than, let's say, a thousand years in duration of high population levels. And at the end of that time, if we haven't got a good energy source, we'll have to go back to something like a caveman existence, and most of the population of the world would have to be involved in some sort of a destructive cataclysmic event or gradually dying off. I want to make it clear that I'm talking in long range terms, I'm talking about, say, 500 years into the future. But now is the time for us to start thinking about it and preparing for it. One of the things that distinguishes man from the other animals is his ability to use energy other than his own to do his work. But the sources of that energy have changed. AEC Director of Environmental Affairs, Joseph DiNuno, spoke of that in a talk at the Institute on Man and Science. From prehistoric times to the year 1700, man's supplemental energy was confined to animal muscles, and the energy from wood and other materials used essentially for cooking and heating. By 1870, the Industrial Revolution was in full swing, and in the 1880s, energy became available in its most versatile form, electricity. Petroleum, first discovered in this country in 1860, did not become a major source of fuel until the early 1900s. The cars we run today, the airplane power that we're generating by oil, which is a dominant one, didn't come into being until the early 1900s. Natural gas is a latecomer to the scene, around about 1930. Commissioner Thompson had this to say when asked what our energy needs were going to be. Well, we have a very good idea of what these power needs will be up through the next 20 or 30 years. And in general, it looks like the power needs would be doubling about every 10 years. We have to continue to increase the amount of power to match the growth of the population at least, and maybe a little more. And if we don't at least match the growth of the population, people will be suffering a reduced standard of living. Well, how well supplied are we when it comes to the sources of our energy? Director DiNuno. 
numbers come out to the effect that, and I think that the Federal Power Commission would verify these since they regulate the gas industry, that our gas supply in this country is extremely tight. Uh, you see numbers like uh, 15 or 20 years availability of gas, which to me was uh, rather disturbing because I hadn't realized we were quite so short. The oil picture varies anywhere from 70 to 100 years, uh, depending on how much you guess is up in the Alaskan uh, oil strike and its availability so far as we're concerned. The coal number will go up to 300 years, uh, roughly again, depending on the accuracy. Now, should these figures be accurate, should we come to the end of our fossil sources for energy, then we could substitute electricity. But up to now, most of our electricity has been produced with the help of fossil fuels. Only since the end of World War II has a substitute, nuclear energy, been found and used. But a nuclear plant differs from a fossil fuel plant only in what is burned to supply heat. In a nuclear plant, that is uranium. We asked Commissioner Thompson about our supply of uranium. Under the present regime of reactors, the uranium supply is available at about the same price levels until the beginning of the next century. If we develop the breeder reactors, which we are presently in the midst of doing, uh, and if this is successful as we would expect it to be, we would have a source of fuel for several hundred years. A breeder reactor is a reactor which breeds more fuel from uranium-238 by turning it into plutonium than it utilizes of uranium-235 or other materials. In other words, it tends to breed more fuel than it uses up. In natural uranium, there's about seven-tenths of one percent of the uranium is uranium-235, and that's the present fuel for the reactors. And each fission gives on the average two and a half neutrons. One of those neutrons continues the chain reaction. If you can take another neutron, say, and interact it with the other fraction of the uranium, the largest bulk of it, the 99.3%, which is uranium-238, you can turn that from uranium-238 momentarily to uranium-239 and then converge to neptunium and then to plutonium-239, which now is a fuel like the original uranium-235. That's complicated, but that's the essence of the picture of what makes a breeder worthwhile. Instead of using 1 or 2 percent of the uranium, which we're doing now, we would, under this regime of breeder reactors, use about 60 to 80 percent. So it's really a very fine goal. Since by the year 2000, it's estimated that with our population increase and our increase in per capita use of electricity, we will need from four and a half to six times as much electricity as we do now. This would seem to be a fine goal indeed, but not everyone agrees. Born of the bomb, the idea of nuclear energy inspires fear at the worst, caution at best. But one fear is absolutely groundless, according to Dr. Dean Abramson, Vice Chairman of Scientists Institute for Public Information. When you talk about an accident in the power reactors that are being built now, you are not talking about an atomic explosion. It is impossible that there be an explosion of the type associated with a nuclear weapon. What you're talking about is something that would happen within the reactor, for example, a loss of its cooling water, such that the reactor would essentially melt down and all of the radioactive material that's in the reactor would be released into the atmosphere. That is a major accident. The major accident results in widespread dispersal of radioactive wastes, which can have enormous significance but it does not include a explosion associated with nuclear weapons. No, your local power company will not turn into an atomic bomb. But atomic scientists do talk of the maximum credible accident. Well, what is that? Here is Dean Chauncey Starr of the School of Engineering and Applied Science at the University of California at Los Angeles. In trying to determine how you design a nuclear plant from the point of view of protecting the public from containing radioactivity, one hypothesizes 
the worst possible sequence of events which would release the maximum amount of radioactivity inside whatever the containment building is. That's called the maximum credible accent. And what you do is you actually set yourself a game. You say, let's assume item one goes wrong and item two, which is a protective device, doesn't work. It's like you're driving a car and you say, okay, my hydraulic brakes fail, my mechanical brakes fail, my tires blow out at the same time, my steering gear doesn't go right, and I can't shut off the engine. And you go on the sequence where every single piece of equipment that's supposed to stop the failures doesn't work. Now, what's the worst that can happen? And that's the maximum credible accident. What the engineer then does, and we're doing it today, is that you then design a building around the nuclear reactor that will contain all the radioactivity that might come out of this maximum credible accident. This doesn't mean that you expect it to happen tomorrow or that the probability of all these things going wrong all at, all at the same time is very high. As a matter of fact, that probability is very low. From the public point of view, nuclear plants are probably factors of 10 to 100 times safer than are the conventional fossil fuel plant. Sabotage on a nuclear plant is very difficult because to make sabotage work on a nuclear plant, from the point of view of the public hazard, you have to get everything failing all at the same time. It's easy to stop the plant. All I have to do is throw up a bomb in the control room and the plant will automatically shut down. It has all kinds of automatic safeguards. But now suppose I really want to injure the public. I not only have to blow up the control room, I have to go and blow up every one of the safety equipment. I then have to blast open the vault that has the nuclear reactor in it. It's in a heavy steel concrete vault. And then I have to blast open the building to let the activity out. All of this in sequence and all of this taking a massive amount of explosives because these are really very massive structures. I'd say sabotage is probably the least of all the risks. It's just too difficult. But not everyone exudes Dr. Starr's confidence. Dr. Paul Ehrlich, author of The Population Bomb, for instance. The technology today is not such that we can safely build fission plants, and in fact, they're trying to move to a fast breeder reactor, which is even more dangerous than the standard ones. Now, what are the dangers in nuclear power generation? Well, one danger is, of course, of catastrophic accident at the reactor. They've already come very close on several of them. If a fission reactor goes bad, what can happen is you get basically a large conventional explosion, much smaller than an atomic bomb, but a large explosion which releases much more dangerous radioactivity than any number of nuclear bombs. For instance, if the Fermi plant, which almost blew outside of Detroit, had blown entirely, they had a catastrophic accident that they contained just before this point, if the weather conditions had been right, we could have lost upwards of 5 to 10 million people and had 10% of the United States made uninhabitable. That's a very big risk to run. Dean Starr was formerly president of Atomics International, a division of North American Aviation. His comment on Fermi? What happened in Fermi is that uh, the internal reactor cooling system had a loose piece of metal in it which shut off part of the flow. As a result, some of the fuel elements melted down and it did stop the plant. But there was no public exposure. Nothing came out of the plant. There is a big distinction between equipment failure, which shuts down the plant, and public hazard. They are not the same thing at all. And it's very difficult, in fact, to get activity out of a modern nuclear plant. How close did we come to losing Detroit because of the Fermi accident? Some experts tell us not only was there no danger to Detroit, but that the Fermi accident actually proved how efficient AEC precautions have been. Others disagree violently. One of these is Dr. Ehrlich. The Fermi plan could not be used by any sane person to prove anything except that the technology is nowhere near to the point that it should be. And just because good luck saved them from wiping out Detroit and making 10% of the United States uninhabitable, they brag about their safety record. The AEC defines what a safe record is. If you define all the accidents that have occurred and all the people that have been killed as having been in experimental situations, then there has never been a death or any immediate danger from a reactor accident. If, however, you read the accounts of what the people at the Fermi plant thought, uh, it is quite clear that at that time they came within a hair's breadth 
of releasing enough radioactivity to kill millions and millions of people. Beyond that, you see, the AEC also defines all the future deaths, all the cancer deaths and so on as non-existent. They're now setting up a set of standards which could easily lead to 32,000 additional deaths per year in the society from leukemia and diseases such as that. But they define this as safe. In fact, the AEC has been harassing the what are probably the two best health physicists in the country, Drs. Goffman and Pamplin, who are actually AEC employees and have pointed out repeatedly that the AEC is utterly incompetent in trying to protect the public from their weird experiments with nuclear power. It's not just the nuclear power plants. They want to do some funny things like blast a canal through Panama with nuclear weapons and they have been sending nuclear devices into space which have been coming back and landing God knows where to pollute the planet. In other words, the AEC has a long record of being totally environmentally incompetent. They, for a long time, tried to tell us that fallout was good for us. And it only took massive efforts on the part of biologists to finally get the AEC to turn around and stop the above-ground testing, which has undoubtedly caused many, many problems in one way or another, now or in the future. And so we're back again to what is called the goffman tamplin controversy. Though both of them were AEC employees, they accused the commission of setting standards that would lead to 32,000 additional deaths a year from cancer. Many scientists disagree with their findings. One of these is Dr. Merrill Eisenbud, professor of environmental medicine at the New York University Medical Center. Well, I'm sympathetic to the point of view expressed by these people in the sense that I think they mean well, but they're badly informed. The uh, position that they take is that, uh, on the one hand, the AEC is uh, setting standards for a program that they're responsible to develop. But uh, this is really not so, because the uh, standards are not set by the AEC. They're uh, recommended by the International Radiation Protection Commission, which is a UN-affiliated group that has been in existence since uh, 1928 and uh, whose uh, standards are recognized uh, throughout the world. All the AEC does is take the recommendations of this international group and translate the numbers into regulatory language. The other reason why I think the standards are satisfactory is that there's been a long enough period of time now so they can be tested. The Atomic Energy Program has existed in this country for 28 years. The uh, record has been extremely good. There are a few hundred thousand employees that have been allowed to get 30 times what the average number of the public is allowed to receive. And yet, in this very large group of people that have been under medical observation now ever since the program started, there's been no evidence of any uh, chronic results of their radiation exposure. There have been some accidents, to be sure. There have been six deaths over a 28-year period, but these were due to accidental overexposures and had nothing to do with the kind of thing that the public is concerned about now, which is the small amount of radiation that might come out of a reactor and expose them. It should be noted that many question the fact that there have been only six deaths. They accuse the AEC of covering up data, of misleading interpretations of the facts, and sometimes of downright dishonesty. But science is meant to be exact. How can scientists, sometimes taking the same data, become involved in shrill quarrels, having reached diametrically opposite conclusions? Dr. Abramson. Not everyone agrees with Goffman, Pamplin, and so forth. Most of the people who I hear disagreeing are full-time employees of the AEC or of the utilities. This must be taken into account. Some of them are also very competent. Some of them are administrators, some of them are public relations people, and so forth. There is further basis, though, for disagreement, and that is that at the levels of exposure that we're talking about, there is very little direct experimental evidence. Many of the numbers that one hears about what the risks are at very low exposures are numbers that were arrived at by observations or experiments at higher exposures and were extrapolated into the low range. And from a scientific standpoint, it hasn't been unequivocally proven that low-level exposure is harmful. On the other hand, there is certainly no evidence that it is harmless. And it seems 
from a public health standpoint, to be prudent, to assume that the risk is as was indicated. If it turns out when the final experiments are done, and they may never be, that it's harmless, then we can certainly increase exposures. We've done no harm in the meantime. If it turns out, in fact, that it's harmful, as everyone assumes it is now, that is, everyone who sets standards assumes that it is now, then we've taken a prudent course. But promoters of the use of atomic devices generally are in the camp which opposes Goffman, Tamplin, etc. Dr. Ehrlich adds this. I'm sorry to say that there are a sizable number of scientists who, even if they are knowledgeable, refuse to tell people what's actually going on. And uh, it's too bad, but it's one of the things that's leading us down that road to doom that I'm always accused of crying about. Right now, there is a very strong case being made that the AEC standards for the amount that is allowable for release are at least set ten times too high, and it looks like we are buying ourselves an enormous amount of future trouble by exhausting the capacity of the environment to absorb radioactive materials, and you have to remember that once you pollute with these radioactive materials, you remain polluted often for thousands of years. They have that kind of life. On the third danger is the problem of storing the high-level wastes that come out when you're finished burning the uranium. You still have extremely hot, extremely radioactive waste to get rid of, and there are all kinds of problems there because they have to be sequestered essentially forever. In other words, you have to do something that mankind has never managed before, and that is put these things away safely for thousands of years. And although there are some signs that you might be able to do it by storing them in a glass form in salt mines, there's all kinds of processing that have to go on before that, and a lot of transporting of materials to salt mines, all of which give you great potential for large accidents. The proof of the pudding that the whole technology is incredibly unsafe and very, very premature is that no insurance company will touch it with a 10-foot pole. Americans are fundamentally, through the Price-Anderson Act, being hornswoggled into supporting their own insurance program for this extremely dangerous technology. If you don't believe it, go to your home insurance policy and you'll find that there's a big nuclear explosion, that whatever happens to our nuclear power plant, you're going to pay the price because you can't get insured at home. And the estimates for what could happen in a single accident of the monetary value that would have to be compensated in a single accident in one of these many, many plants that are being built is billions and billions of dollars. If you don't believe it, ask why the insurance companies won't insure you or the power companies, why the government has to do the insuring. I think everybody who's looked into it agrees that there should be an immediate moratorium on the building of fission power plants for at least five years and possibly for longer. It's extremely irresponsible of the AEC. They are without doubt the most dangerous agency in the government at the moment. Eventually, we all hope that we will get controlled fusion, and the estimates on when we might have this fusion device range, the reasonable estimates, from 30 to 50 years. So it's way beyond our current crisis period. That would be a partial solution to some of our problems in the sense that we're wasting our petroleum reserves and so on. Eventually, we're going to have to have another power source. And although the transition will be extraordinarily difficult, because, of course, uh, what you do with something like a fusion device is generate electricity, and yet most of our power is not used in the form of electricity, it seems likely that over a period of 100 years or so, we could convert our relatively energy-rich society into a slightly less energy-rich society, which got a great deal of its energy from fusion, and that would be a very powerful forward step, because the only pollution problems you have to deal with there are Thermal pollution, and thermal pollution, of course, that's a very strict limit on how much energy you can use on the surface of the Earth, but at the moment, we're well below that limit. So that would solve a lot of our power problems, but it would not solve many of our other problems, including our materials problems. Power alone does not make infinite food available or infinite materials or so on. That's all nonsense. Fusion as contrasted to fission. Well, simply stated, the atomic bomb is fission, the hydrogen bomb, fusion. How would fusion work as an energy source? Commissioner Thompson described this. Hydrogen is the lowest atomic number element in the periodic table. There's ordinary hydrogen, and then there is heavy hydrogen, which consists of a neutron and proton, and then there's something called tritium, which has a proton and two neutrons. If I combine two of these heavy isotopes, I make a helium atom. And uh, this takes very high temperatures but if we can achieve these very high temperatures in millions of degrees, we achieve quite a bit of energy. 
Now, in ordinary water, there is about one atom in every 6,800, which is a deuterium atom. If I were to take the deuterium atoms that are in one gallon of that water, and if I could interact those, I would be able to make from one gallon of water the equivalent of 300 gallons of gasoline. Now, since the fuel is basically water, and we've got lots and lots of water in the world, the amount of fuel available in this process is almost infinite. And we would have then, for our civilization, a source of energy which would last for as far as you can see in the future. So, nuclear fusion as a perfect source of power seems to be everyone's choice. But there's one small problem. We don't know yet how to make it work. And some experts don't see it working for over a century from now. Most, however, either hope for or predict an earlier date, some before the turn of the century. One of these is Dr. Tampen. The fusion program has been funded at a very low level compared to the reactor program. Now, the interesting thing is, is that the fast breeder reactor and fusion power are at the present time estimated to be developed within the same time period. If fusion power is developed, the fast breeder will die of stillbirth because the fusion power is truly the answer to the future. Now, this is one of the important things about how our money is being spent in terms of developing our power needs. Much more of our money should be going into techniques for cleaning up the fossil fuel plants because we're going to have fossil fuel as a backbone to the year 2000. Everyone who looks at the future needs for power in this country, electrical power, recognizes the fact that fossil fuel will represent the backbone of the electrical power generation in this country well into the 21st century. Whether we build nuclear power plants or not, we are going to increase the present number of fossil fuel plants. If the projected power needs are real, by the year 2000, we will have five times as many fossil fuel plants as we have today. Everyone recognizes the noxious gases that belch from these fossil fuel plants. The thing that the public probably doesn't recognize is that over the past 15 years, the nuclear energy program has got somewhere in the neighborhood of 95% of the research and development dollars that have been directed towards electrical energy production in this country. That it would have only taken a small fraction of that to have cleaned up the existing fossil fuel plants. The mechanisms for cleaning up the fossil fuel plants or the chemistry is most likely to be found in the 1890 literature from Germany. And as a matter of fact, Squires from Massachusetts Institute of Technology indicated that had we 20 years ago recognized the hazard from the pollutants that are coming from fossil fuel plants, and we had passed laws which would have limited the pollution from the fossil fuel plants, that the net result would be that today we would have cheaper power from fossil fuel plants that would be clean. Had we put the proper regulations on the fossil fuel plants, put the proper R&D money in the development of mechanisms for cleaning up these plants, the present plants that we have today would be producing almost twice as much electricity by improving the efficiency of the operation. And at the same time, these plants would be essentially emitting something close to zero amounts of pollution. Uh, we can and should clean up the fossil fuel plants. We're going to have to because we're going to have more of them by the 21st century. We're engaged in some kind of a ridiculous gamble where we're putting all our money, most likely, into the wrong basket. We're going into a mechanism of generating power that is going to you know, create more problems than it solves where if we would reallocate our research funds, we would most likely arrive at a much more sensible power production system for the future. And so the controversy goes on. Should you want to know more about it, contact organizations who are publishing reports in this field. I'll give you two addresses. 
One of these is the Atomic Industrial Forum, 475 Park Avenue South, New York City. The zip code is 10016. Another organization is the Scientists Institute for Public Information, 30 East 68th Street, New York, 10021. We'll look at some more of our resources in the next of these reports produced by Group W, Westinghouse Broadcasting Company, with Dr. Harry Shapiro of the American Museum of Natural History as consultant. Can Man Survive is written and produced by Walter McGraw. Bill Kaland is the executive producer. I'm Gary Moore.